songs about God and even songs about Jesus have been a part of history for now thousands of years. We sing these songs as we assemble on the Lord's Day and on other occasions. But occasionally, secular composers will put together a song relating to God or to Jesus. Sometimes the results are a bit lacking, but they do indicate that people are at least thinking about God or about his son Jesus. Back in the 1990s, there was a song by Joan Osborne called One of Us. And a few of the words went like this. What if God were one of us, just a slob like one of us, just a stranger on the bus trying to make his way home? And the song goes on to explore what would it actually mean if we accepted God as God? How would that affect us? Well, Joan's idea of God is probably not like that of ours. But the question she asks is revealed to us in this morning's text. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 through 18. Now it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere. What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now I'm putting everything in subjection to him. He left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell you of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation I will sing your praise. And again I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children of God has given me. Since, therefore, the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject, subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers, in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Hebrews chapter 1 declares Jesus' divinity. Jesus is God. God become man, as we read elsewhere in Scripture. The author of Hebrews makes the point that Jesus is superior to angels, compares them with the angels. He's superior to them. Hebrews chapter 2 hails Jesus' humanity. Yes, Jesus is divine. He is God become man. He is the Son of God. But he also, for a short time, became human. I think it was in Bible class a Sunday or two ago that we were discussing that in the past, past centuries, there was an argument over whether Jesus was, or how much of a percentage God was, Jesus was divine, how much percentage he was human. They were trying to come up, well, was he fully God and just not man? Was he man, not fully God, or was he a percentage thereof? Well, the correct answer is that Jesus was fully God and is fully God and he was fully man while here on earth. 
Here in our text this morning is the first time the author refers to Jesus by name. Previously, he's referred to him as the Son of Man or other titles. This is in verse 9. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus. This is a key verse of the book of Hebrews. But here in these verses, the author shows that Jesus, the divine, also became Jesus the man. By becoming a man, Jesus identified with humanity. Jesus left heaven. Chapter 1 points out that he's superior to the angels. Chapter 2 says, for a little while, he became a little lower than the angels. He became a man. I don't know whether it's still in the air or not. I haven't seen it lately, but for a while there was a show on TV called Undercover Boss. The head of a company, the one who made the big money, the one who was in charge, <coughs> would go undercover to see just how his company was functioning. Some very interesting results. He discovered that some of his managers weren't being good to employees. He discovered things that could be done better. But he did this by assuming an identity other than his own. God became a man. This man, Jesus, was yes, fully God. He experienced some of the limitations of being human. He got hungry, he got thirsty, he got tired. He was tempted to sin. The writer of Hebrews will tell us he was tempted to sin, but he did not sin. But Jesus became a human. He could identify with us. As John MacArthur states in his commentary, every religion is but man's attempt to discover God. Christianity is God bursting into man's world and showing and telling man what he is like. Down through the history of the world, Men and women have worshipped someone or something. Some would say, well, we started out very unknowledgeable and worshipped many gods, and over a period of time we decided there was just the one. I don't know where they came up with that. That's false. The world began with one God, the God who created the world. And it was man who in his sin departed from the one God and created his own gods, little g. He began to worship the sun, the river, the moon, whatever there was, he worshiped it. And so man was searching for God. The real God was there. Sometimes it seemed that humans couldn't find him or they didn't want to find him. Sometimes they wanted to create a God in their own image. In Greek mythology, you have all these various gods. And they all have human characteristics. In fact, the weaknesses of humans. The one true God does not have those limitations. In fact, Scripture says that God cannot lie. God is all-powerful, all-knowing. He's everywhere. And it is the one true God who in Jesus became a man and identified with humanity. By becoming a man, Jesus dignified humanity. Here is God. Here is us. We're sinful. We rebelled against God. We needed someone to put us back in a right relationship with God. This was all in God's plan. It boggles my mind to think that before God ever created this universe, before God ever created us, that he was planning how to save us. God knew before he created us that we would sin. He made us as individuals of choice. As individuals of choice, he knew that we would choose wrongly. 
And so God already had the plan of salvation in his mind before he ever created us. Part of that was Jesus becoming one of us. In fact, to the point that he calls us brother or sister. Fully human as well as fully divine. Athanasius, many centuries ago, wrote, He became what we are, that he might make us what he is. Jesus is our perfect example. Peter will say in his letter that we should walk in his steps. The Apostle Paul in his letters would, on an occasion or two, say, Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. It does help to see a human who's living for the Lord. But ultimately, we need to follow the example of Jesus. He became a man, lived as human, lived a perfect human life. That is something we cannot do. Because of the grace of God demonstrated in Jesus Christ and in his death, we receive the righteousness of of Christ. Because he was perfect, we are considered righteous. And yes, Jesus is willing to call us brother or sister. I don't hear quite as much as I used to. We used to greet each other very much in the church as brother so-and-so and sister so-and-so. Seeing as years went on, the only brother referred to was the preacher. <laughs> uh, we have these different practices that go on through the years. But whether we call each other brother or sister or not, we do have that relationship, don't we? And that should determine how we live. Uh, I don't suppose this ever happened in your family. Sibling robbery. Well, unless you were an only child, it happened in your family. It's just part of the way it's going to be. That brothers and sisters don't get along. On the other hand, they will stick up for each other if somebody comes and attacks one of them. As we have our relationship with Jesus, our brother, that should affect our relationship with each other. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. We should be one. We should be sticking up for each other. But again, the main emphasis here, the author is saying, Jesus, the Son of God, God, lowered himself for a little while and became one of us. By becoming a man, Jesus delivered humanity. Jesus became a man so that he could die for us. There was no other adequate sacrifice for sin. In the religion God gave to Moses, to the Israelites, sacrifices were offered. A little later in Hebrews, the author will point out, these could not really take care of our sins. There had to be a perfect sacrifice. There was not a human on earth who could do that because everyone who ever lived had sinned. So God became a man and he lived that perfect sinless life. Jesus was qualified to be our sacrifice for sins. He could only do that if he became human. And so he did. Vance Havner told a story about an elderly lady who was greatly disturbed by her many troubles, both real and imaginary. Finally, someone in her family tactfully told her, Grandma, we've done all for you that we can. You'll just have to trust God for the rest. A look of absolute despair spread over her face as she replied, O 
oh dear, has it come to that? Well, Habner commented, it always comes to that. So we might as well begin with that. You see, we can't save ourselves. That's the bad news. But the good news is that we have a Savior. Jesus, in becoming one of us, was able to die for our sins. And so we can have forgiveness. We can have his righteousness. We can be saved. In Scripture, we're told that Jesus has been glorified, that he's reigning at the right hand of God. We're told that he left, he had that, and he left that for a little while. Now he has it again. James Thompson very briefly put it, put it very well. Before the crown, there was the cross. We don't like to think about suffering. We go out of our way not to suffer. Speaking physically, but there's also other kinds of suffering, isn't there? And sometimes we may equate suffering with weakness or even failure. But suffering was a part of the life of Jesus, a part of his death. He suffered for us. And in that suffering, he was then glorified. And as we're told in Scripture, as Christians, we share in his suffering as well as sharing in his glory. Throughout the book of Hebrews, the author will again and again make the case that Jesus is better than, he is superior to any and everything. The first readers are being tempted to leave their faith in Christ, their relationship with Christ, and go to some other system of religion. The author says, why would you leave what is best for something inferior? It was only Jesus, the Son of God, who became man, lived among us, and died for us. It is only Jesus who is now reigning at the right hand of God. We have a Savior, Jesus, a superior Savior. He is like one of us in many ways, and he calls upon us to be like him. Jesus knows what we need. You may recall the song, He Knows Just What I Need. My Jesus knows when I am lonely. He knows each pain, He sees each care. He understands each lonely heartache. He understands because He cares. My Jesus knows just what I need. Oh yes, He knows just what I need. He satisfies and every need supplies. Yes, He knows. Just what I need. Shall we stand and sing?